So as per usual, we have fantastic sponsors from our From the Field webinar series. Tom and Jan Hoffman, thank you so much for sponsoring us today. We so appreciate that. If you would like to sponsor one of our webinars, please contact Kate at that phone number or Kate at Saving Cranes. We would love it. We're going to continue on with our series. So we would love to have you sponsor. Today, I'm very excited. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. So we do, we're going to start with, oh, behave. Your crane antics questions demystified. And I am Ann Lacey. I'm senior manager of the North America programs here at the Crane Foundation. And I am joined by Hannah Jones. Um, behind the scenes hero of the webinar series. Um, so she is coming forward. She did the heavy lifting on this webinar today, people. So happy to do this with her. And also as an added bonus, she is one of the creative geniuses behind the member moments videos that member, many of you see every month. So, that, <laughs> thank you, Hannah, for that. <laughs> and if you would like to see those beautiful videos, please become a member of the International Crane Foundation today. Hannah, take it away. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Anne is one of my favorite people. I've worked with her on multiple of these webinars, and I'm so, so grateful to be able to be kind of front and center. Um, I have an environmental education background, so I'm going to hopefully show you a little bit of that today during the webinar. So I'll start us off here uh, before we get too deep into behaviors. So as a preface, um, I'm sure many of you are aware that there are 15 crane species that span the globe. The only place you can't find or crane species is in Antarctica, very cold, and in South America, but they are found on every other continent. And we here at the International Crane Foundation work with all 15 species. Um, but why cranes? We get that question a lot. Why do we work with cranes? Um, one of those main reasons out of many is that 11 of the species are threatened with extinction. So a number of them are anywhere from threatened, vulnerable, all the way to critically endangered. Um, so these birds that you see here on the screen. And then four of those species are of least concern. And we still work greatly with these species, just monitoring them um, and making sure they have everything they need along their flyaway. Um, so to kind of go back to those 15 crane species, um, the reason that we started the International Crane Foundation, our co-founders, Dr. George Archibald and Dr. Ron Sowie, is that they saw that these cranes um, needed help, but they were threatened, or, um, threatened with extinction. And so in the 70s is when we began the International Crane Foundation. So it is no surprise that since the 70s and far, far before that, we have always been interested in cranes um, and what they do when you see them out in the wild um, and why are they threatened with extinction and, and how can we help that? So I will show you a picture of some birders here. This was taken in 2019. So it's no surprise that today we are still so interested um, in cranes and, and have been for centuries, like I mentioned. But why are we still so enamored with cranes today? Um, what makes them so unique and inspiring? What draws people to them? Um, well, one of my favorite things about cranes is that you don't need to be a birder to see cranes. I may show you a birding picture here, but it's true that cranes are such an accessible group of birds. You don't need fancy equipment to see cranes. You can see them maybe in your backyard. Um, you don't have to travel millions of miles away to see cranes. Um, so that's one of my favorite things is they're so accessible. You can see how they're interacting with their environment um, and see um, how we will how we need to save these cranes by um, how they are interacting with their environment just through looking with your own eyes. So that's one of my favorite things. And this beautiful scene um, was taken by Si Ming, um, an amazing photographer, and she took this photo in South Africa. Um, si Ming is actually, we work a lot with her, and she is doing January's webinar. So stay tuned when we talk about that at the end. Um, so the previous photo I just showed was a flock of gray crowned cranes and walled cranes in South Africa. And here we have whooping cranes off the coast of Texas. Um, so we may say this a lot, but cranes are really ambassadors for their species or for um, birds and their environment in general. They're such ambassadors for landscapes. Um, if cranes aren't doing well, 
we know that their landscapes and these wetland habitats that they depend on aren't doing well either. Um, crane, uh, whooping cranes, for example, their numbers are so low. We just um, released their numbers for this year was around 800 um, in North America, and that's not a lot of cranes. They're the rarest species. Um, and one of those main reasons is because of habitat loss. And a lot of cranes are threatened with this across the world. Um, so if we were to drain all the wetlands, say in North America, we wouldn't no longer have cranes and we would see that in their population numbers. So being ambassadors for other um, species that depend on these wetland habitats is also such an amazing um, reason to support cranes and those ecosystems that they depend on. Also very interesting is that whooping cranes depend highly on blue crab populations in Texas. So that interconnectedness is an interesting um, way to look at is it um, whooping crane foraging behavior and blue crab populations, we can definitely see that in whooping crane numbers. And our Texas team talks greatly about that in our previous webinar, but I won't get too in deep with that. Um, but foraging behavior is one of many behaviors that we can watch and research with cranes and seeing how they're interacting with their environment. You may also notice in this photo that there are only two cranes um, as opposed to the previous photo. And that is because cranes can be in large numbers, but they can also be extremely rare and elusive. So maybe seeing a whooping crane in Wisconsin would be such a big event, and it is. Um, so that's something really amazing about cranes too, is they can be so rare, but also um, congregate in such large numbers. Um, so a lot of us may be familiar with the massive migration of sandhill cranes through the heart of North America. Um, on the Platte River in Nebraska. So we talk a lot about that massive migration, um, but for this large congregation imagery, I thought I'd show you this really cool video that I found of hooded cranes in their on their wintering ground in South Korea. Um, so there's no sound with this video, so don't be expecting sound, but I thought we could just watch this together and, and it's a really cool scene. It's also really awesome to watch uh, cranes and kind of group dynamics. You may see them as a pair bond, but also how they interact in a group setting. And then they just whoosh, <laughs> like a sea of hooded cranes. It is, it is an ocean. Yeah, it is. Wow. This is a really stunning video, Hannah. And, and it's great to see that many cranes, but we also get concerned when there are that many cranes mm -hmm. in such close proximity due right. to you know disease issues and things like mm -hmm. that. So. Very things true. that we watch for. Yes, and things that cranes can tell us. And then this point I would also like to make is that cranes are so amazing that they tell us a lot about our past. Um, so we may watch sandhill cranes soaring in the skies or um, as they interact with one another, they give us such a great look at kind of our fossil records through their anatomy, through their behaviors. Um, and I really like this picture is because they look a lot like pterodactyls flying into the sky. So sandhill cranes in particular have one of the earliest fossil records of any um, bird alive today. Um, in the 1920s, an almost 10 million year old fossil was found in Nebraska, and it is believed to be a direct ancestor of the sandhill crane. So they can tell us a lot about our past, our present, and our future. Who amongst us hasn't compared them to dinosaurs. <laughs> right, exactly. You can see the comparison. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. And then one of the final notes I wanted to make too is that we also see cranes in so many different cultures and traditions across the world. Cranes can connect us to some of these cultures that we may not normally be familiar with, um, like the, cr the crane festival in Mongolia in the summer as they celebrate the white-naped crane. Or as you see red crowned cranes throughout art and literature in Japan and with the origami cranes. So cranes are celebrated in multiple different ways um, and really connect us to culture. They break boundary, boundaries and they bring people together despite the odds. So all of these different components maybe are why we love cranes. Maybe there's a reason that you love cranes that's not on this list. Um, but a lot of this can be drawn back to one thing in particular and maybe that's because of how cranes behave. What really, um, how cranes act, how um, their biology really uh, ed or is so interesting to us, such as um, how cranes live 20 to 30 years, so they're a symbol of longevity, or how um, cranes are such great parents, maybe that inspires you. 
or the fact that they're so vocal and they show when they're angry and we show how we show when we're angry. So it's just, it's very interesting to watch how cranes behave in the wild when they're happy, um, when they're angry and all these different components. So kind of with that transition, I thought I'd hand it over to Anne to talk a little bit more about what behavior is and some of these classifications too. Phenomenal. Thank you, Hannah. Mm -hmm. So the first word of the day for folks, some have, may <laughs> never have heard of ethology. And that is the study of behavior. And I've often said to people that, you know, any student of animal behavior should study cranes because obviously they have such a huge suite of behaviors, but there's no accidental behaviors. Everything means something. So we'll try to go through some of those today. Um, starting off with, right on, our very own George Archibald did his PhD back in the 70s on the unison call. So he picked one very, very specific behavior to look at how the unison call can divide up each of the species. So he used it as a taxonomic tool. And obviously there's more in, involved, uh, there's physiology uh, involved in that also. And he was only able to, to study 13 of the 15 species, um, but this, phylogenetic relationship still holds up. So fast forward to 2021. And this paper came out just this year. And this, uh, these authors found that the behavior of cranes, and so this is in the family Grudae, it mirrors their phylogenetic relationships. So this is something that still holds. So this graph is just one figure that kind of, and, it, and it's arranged a little bit differently, but those groupings remain the same to what George found in the 1970s. So phylogenetic, the next word for the day. Um, so that is that branching diagram. So what you may call a family tree um, in this, uh, in evolutionary terms is that phylogeny. So how these birds are related to each other and when they stopped kind of being related to each other or how far apart those relationships go. And so you can see the other thing about this is many of you may not have ever seen the genus and species names of some of our favorite cranes. So we'll kind of skip through these quickly, but up here on top, the very first branch of, of this that separates out some of these crane species, we have the crowned cranes. So we have the gray and black crowned crane that have diverged from the rest of the crane species about 30 million years ago. So they are um, still very much cranes, but a lot different from what we um, uh, see maybe with our sandhills in the backyard. And one of the most obvious things maybe that is different is that crown. They don't have a bare head. And any of you that have seen some of behaviors of cranes out in the wild know that they really use that red to signal a lot of things. So there is one very, very specific suite of behaviors that defines these cranes from the crown cranes. We have the Siberian crane, also a little bit more ancient uh, than the rest of these species. And here we have a grouping that some of you might not recognize as and this is Antigone. Um, these were separated out very recently from the Groose species. So there is, uh, some disagreement amongst geneticists um, that say that maybe there isn't enough. Um, this is this is going back down to the DNA level, of course, but there might not be enough uh, of difference at that level to separate them out from these Gru species. So we have Sandhills, uh, Gru or Antigone vipio, uh, the white naped, the Saris uh, Antigone Antigone um, and the Brolga. All of these are grouped together based on behaviors though. So this does hold. Grus Japonensis, so we have the red crown crane, of course the whooping crane, Eurasian, black necked, and the hooded crane that are all grouped together. We have waddled, we have demoiselle and the blue crane. Also, so these are grouped together based on these behaviors. And these letters are just shorthand for the, the specific behaviors that these researchers looked at to say, when did they appear? And most likely in this case, that when did they disappear to make these species different from others? 
So we'll go into a little bit of those and, and kind of look at these, these behaviors and what they mean to these individual cranes, but we'll always kind of come back to this and how they are different from other species. Um, these behaviors define cranes. Like I say, there are no accidental behaviors with cranes, but it, it, it defines the differences between each of them. So in the intensity of the behavior that's shown by these species, um, but also their relatedness. Um, and so before we go on, I want to let people know that we have a lot of fantastic videos and sound that Hannah has been able to acquire. And we are so thankful for everyone that, that this is why we watch cranes because they're so great. Sound is on your end. Uh, so it's controlled by your device, just so you know that. However, some of these unison calls might be very, very loud. So if you're wearing earbuds, I'm warning you now, you might wanna modify your, <laughs> your volume just in case we don't want any ear damage. So let's go, Hannah. All right. So I know that some, at least somebody out there is wearing their Oh Behave t-shirt. And the, so the next word of the day is anthropomorphize. So these tall species uh, that uh, have many human characteristics, we tend to identify with more. So of course, we're gonna start off with maybe what we all recognize the most, their unison call, and let's make beautiful music together. So a lot of these species like the white nape have very, very distinctive unison calls is one way to tell male from female. So let's see, let's see how, how these guys do their unison call. Very distinct posture very distinct voice that comes together to make one sound and that is the unison call and so that is one way that they enforce their pair bond together so that is probably the most powerful uh reason to have that unison call but each of the species has very very different calls and this is what george was looking into they all have very different postures and voices Hopefully right, so, people recognize yeah. this first one. Go ahead and play some of these. <laughs> Very intimidating. <laughs> So again, the, the SARS has a brilliant display in addition to the, um, and with the postures in the unison call. And I so hope that's, that many of you who are able to visit our new site renovations this year got to hear the unison, the unison call, the SARS cranes, they were, they were very happy in their exhibit this year and they were doing that a lot. And our beloved Sandhills, they also have a very different voice. So we listened to the, the white nape, let's skip ahead to the blue cranes. kind of a, I believe that's a guard call kind of going into unison call, but you can hear it a little bit at the end. Yeah, you can tell there's two voices in there. Mm -hmm. And then finally the Siberian crane and also very well known for their posture and, and, and call for their unison call. back to that family tree again, you know, whooping cranes and red crown cranes were close together on that. And you can see um, different postures, different sounds, different reasons for making these unison calls. So 
Um, there is territorial reasons for this. There is defensive reasons for this, but a lot of it is pair bonding and really bringing them into um, the breeding condition in the spring with a new mate or an old mate and really that, that synchronization of behaviors is huge. So this is a good example of one behavior that serves many purposes. <laughs> Including this. So here, this is, a, this is a little bit of a different one that we found. So based on posture, we know that these are two males and this is obviously in the winter time. So, that you know, thinking back to that phylogenetic tree that the that um, separates the Siberian crane out from some other species. Those are two males, and one might be defending his mate if that's his mate in front of him from another male, or trying to win her over, and she seems nonplussed, <laughs> paying hard to get. Um, but that that drop wings that is also a very very ritualized behavior that they have developed as part of their unison call. Um, so all of that kind of plays in together as part of this one behavior. Love it. Another one by Siming. So please join us next month. Uh, who doesn't know about cranes dancing? May I have this dance? Another very specific behavior. This is our blue cranes. And uh, Brad Gibbons from our South Africa program took this video. And so you can see here, this is a, a pair on their territory. And just, you know, this is something that really and, and strengthens that pair bond. We'll talk about that, that stick that you just grabbed in a second. But you can imagine that this, this jumping around is just um, really strengthens that bond between the two. But they also just might be having fun. You know, if we're going to anthropomorphize, we might as well just go for it. I hope that they have fun doing that. And it's just an expression of joy. Anyone who has been to the Platte River might recognize this view from the blinds uh, at the Rose Sanctuary. So a lot of dancing going on here. And this is in the spring. So this is when pair bonds are being formed, but definitely being strengthened as the breeding hormones are coming back into the bloodstream. But there's also, again, this is a very territorial bird. And so here with thousands and thousands of closest friends, these birds might be getting a little antsy um, with so much closeness. So another thing that dancing does do is it's a stress reliever rather than getting in fisticuffs with your neighbor it's it's easier to get that stress out by jumping up and down and dancing like that and again it's how can you not think that that is might be joyful but that is that is pure <laughs> human projection there that we just I, we just love to watch them do that And our black neck cranes, and I do believe that this is in the Pajipka Valley in Bhutan. It looks awful frosty. So these pairs can dance and unison call all year. Again, to eat sometimes, in the, if, especially if you're in a crowd, it might be one way to know that you're with your mate. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Bernard Wessling in Germany has done work with the vocalizations of cranes for years and can identify pairs uh, via vocalizations and determine territories. And so that is definitely a way that these birds can tell each other apart and their, their uh, territories. Whoopee! Again, stick tossing is something that you might see, especially in the fall when there's lots of detritus in agricultural fields, for example. very much a ritualized behavior. So it is something that may have evolved out of nest building. So, you know, taking this material that they're building their nest on the ground with, but it had kind of morphing into, again, uh, enhancing pair bonds. 
um, winning over a mate. You know, there's other bird species that give, you know, bring sticks as gifts for their mate to show that they can build a nest. So it could have, um, have, have ties into that, but you will all often see them picking up material in their territories and chucking it around. Often, often as part of their dancing. Ooh, so very, very ritualized. Here are Brolga down in Australia. Just jumping around, picking up a stick. Might be a snake, not quite sure. Stones also, this one picked up a stone and just flipped it up in the air. But a good way to hang out with your mate. I just love to dance. So here's a behavior that is probably also, it, it definitely has a functional purpose, making yourself so big. So we have this, this crane, obviously, that is, can stretch in the morning. But you, if you make yourself, make yourself big, that is pretty classic um, way to make yourself seen, um, but also to warm up your muscles in the, in, the, in the morning when it gets cold. But also for defense. And we had to look at this picture a moment to realize, so that's a chick uh, of... Uh, red crowned crane and the parent is actually herding away it might be a marmot down there in the corner so when they when cranes see a predator they will make themselves big like this and herd whatever it is away from what from a nest a young chick like that but so this uh, chick is obviously fledged but it is learning this good behavior from its parents so it can be a defensive posture But also you got to strengthen those muscles. So sometimes you see these chicks, they, they stretch and they'll flap, flap, flap to really start building up those muscles before, uh, before they learn to fly. Obligatory cute chick picture. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Preening. So again, this is what I will often say is uh, there are no accidental behaviors. So preening is obviously a maintenance behavior that all birds need to do. But why are they fixing those feathers? because they have a lot of them. <laughs> Most of the of any given crane's day will be taken up with the preening and conditioning those feathers and making sure they maintain their, their structural integrity for flying, their waterproofness. And here are black neck cranes. Oh, there's a good behavior. I was gonna mention that. They also bird watch. When I see a crane doing that, I look up because there's often a neat bird that I would like to see up there as an aside. So these uh, black neck cranes are at our new exhibits in uh, at our headquarters here in Baraboo. And so they're just they're just fixing their feathers and making sure that they are presentable for our guests. Likewise, our whooping crane. Um, but depending on the situation, and sometimes it is very, very subtle, but preening can also be used as a territorial behavior. And often, uh, two birds will come together at kind of the boundary of their territory and they will preen in each other's general direction. And that is just a kind of enforcement of that boundary. So they know I am here and this is my property and you are there, don't cross this line. So a preening can be uh, kind of a defensive-ish behavior as well. And kind of a modification of that, we have a ruffle threat. Go away. It's a very strong message. Go away. And no better example than our SARS crane. And that kind of ruffle, so a ruffle of the feathers, um, often when a bird is on migration or, or coming out of roost for the day, when it lands, it will ruffle its feathers and just kind of get situated. But this is definitively a defensive territorial behavior because he throws his head down 
And if we had audio with this, we might even be able to hear him growl. And you can imagine with that trachea that cranes are famous for, um, very dinosaur-esque if I could ever hear a dinosaur, um, that deep-throated growl that really sends the message, go away. And here are black-crowned cranes with that beautiful ruffle. And, and something that I learned when reading that paper about the, the behaviors of these specific cranes, and again, the black crowned crane kind of diverged from the rest of the Gruidae very, very early on in the evolution of this family, that they really don't have a, a, a threat behavior associated with this. Um, but these are captive birds. And so also that mutual preening that they're doing is a very ritualized behavior. So some of this might be um, based on them being a, a captive species, which you also have to kind of separate out. There's a lot of behaviors in captive birds um, that don't, um, that a lot of birds wouldn't do in that species in the wild. So just always keep that in mind, which is why we like to keep our birds happy and healthy in our naturalistic exhibits and really give them a lot of enrichment to make sure that they maintain those natural behaviors. Shake it out. So that's kind of that situa situating the, the, the feathers, but it could be directed at uh, someone walking by. Um, head rub, also a very good, a very, very telling behavior that could be maintenance, could be a threat. One never knows with white napes. <laughs> oh, the drop wing. So th this is definitely a, I'm not bluffing, get out type of behavior. And if you look that bird in the eye and he's doing that to you, <laughs> you really, really, really should take the hint. So Saris are, are uh, very much an intimidating species. But perhaps most famously known for the drop wing threat is our Siberian crane. And here is a pair that is in our Crane City breeding facility here at ICF. And again, it's too bad that we don't have the sound, but some folks that may have been able to visit us here at our site have had the pleasure of hearing there is a very definitive growl that goes along with that behavior. And that is, again, very, very ritualized, kind of probably evolved out of that, that making yourself big, you drop that wing, you show off those beautiful black primary feathers. And there is a very, very much of a message, stay out, <laughs> go away, get out. Ah, I often get asked about their beak and should I be afraid of their beak? No, if they wanna say beat it, they use their feet. And here is a red crowned crane, which I can't imagine anybody other than that sea eagle trying to make a go at that. But you can see those long legs uh, protected by those tough scoots are about the only thing that's gonna protect you from the talons of that beautiful eagle. And so that jump rake is something that is often used in a very much a defensive manner, which is also why cranes tend to dance to get rid of those, <laughs> those, uh, those feelings of angst, because those cranes don't necessarily want to fight each other. Um, they wouldn't want that coming at them. Like in this video. Boom. So this is very much a fisticuffs. It is very rare. I've not seen it very often where two cranes are resolving a dispute via, via this method. Um, and it can lead to uh, mortality or morbidity. They can be hurt doing this. So they, they use it very rarely, but you wanna watch out for those feet. And lastly, in this migration season, this is something you might see in flocks of birds. It's time for me to fly. So that, that head pointed down, often into the wind, and the next 
Next thing that will happen is that crane right out in front of it is showing. So they start to flap their wings and give one or two steps, depending on how strong the wind is, and they hop up in the air. But that is definitely a behavior that you will see often out in the open. Um, when a group is together and they're looking at each other and getting ready to fly back to roost, a lot of them will put their head out and wait for everybody else to get ready, and then they will all take off together. Like our whooping cranes here in Texas. They kind of give each other that look. You don't want to leave anybody behind, but you also don't want to leave by yourself. Goodbye, cranes. So that was a very, very brief overview of a really complicated subject. So I just, why we definitely wanted to, to hit the behaviors that you might see most often. And actually this closing slide has a very, very interesting behavior in it. And I don't know if people can guess. I mean, that this is probably taken at Bosque del Apache down in uh, New Mexico, um, where cranes are gathering right now in large numbers. Um, but it's very cold. And I don't know if you notice, there's three cranes in this picture that don't have legs. <laughs> and it slays me every time I see this happen, that these birds will tuck their legs as they fly. And think about that, they come out of water and they have water on their, their legs that once they get up into this cold air, it would be very, very cold. And so they tuck their legs to keep them warm. So a very, very uh, subtle, unique behavior. But um, I always, I guess I just wanna always keep looking. They're always doing something absolutely fascinating. And again, like Hannah described, we love them because we can see them. They're so visible, um, but they have such a wonderful suite of behaviors that we all so appreciate. So with that- yeah, We'll take questions. I, I hope, hope, hope that people have some good questions. Andy Gassens, are you out there? Yeah, hi, Ann and Hannah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy Gossens. I'm the, I work here at the Crane Foundation, and I've been uh, consolidating these questions here and have some pretty good ones for for Anne and Hannah. The first one, the first one being, do cranes mate for life? Aha! <laughs> yes, but <laughs> not for life. It depends how you spin the question, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, they they do. And again, you know, this is goes back to that anthropomorphizing. We have these cranes that have, you know, so many of these behaviors that we're we're looking at. The the top row are all pair bonding behaviors, and they do have a uh, long term monogamous pair bonds, and they they both share in raising of the chicks. However, uh, we have documented we have a long term. Uh, study area there where we have been marking sand hills for over 30 years now. And so by doing that, we can watch them year to year. And we have documented divorce. So that is actually where we have seen two, two birds that have been maintaining a territory and, and possibly even raised chicks. But then the next year, the bird is still alive, but it's on a territory with someone else, or it has been replaced with a non-banded bird. And so um, we know that the bird has not died or just gone someplace else, perhaps, but it's about, uh, you know, that, that length of, be, of research has shown that divorce only happens in about 5%, at least in our study area. So they're doing better than people. <laughs> Um, but they do divorce and we don't know why. Um, it's not directly tied to um, productivity. So the lack of being able to produce chicks necessarily. Um, it's, it's, there's multiple options what might lead to, to divorce and it, it's really hard to tease that out. So that's, that's the short, short answer to a kind of complicated question. Yeah, there's no short answer for that one. Um, yep. uh, can you talk about Zuganru? <laughs> I have that taped above my door. So I see that every day. Zuganru um, is migratory restlessness. And so a lot of what those cranes on the Platte River and those behaviors, uh, the moving around and jumping around and dancing, maybe even stick tossing, 
can be tied to that. And so also what happens in the fall and the spring, and it might be tied to hormones, but more likely it's tied to day length, at least up here, is when the, the there's a cue that when the day length gets to be a certain uh, length, that it's time to go south. Likewise, time to go back north. That might be more hormonally driven because that's when the breeding hormones will start to go. Um, but even our captive birds here at ICF do exhibit this migratory restlessness. So though they cannot uh, fly out of their uh, enclosures here in our breeding facility, um, they might kind of put their head down in that pre-flight posture and run or flap across their enclosures, um, especially when it's a day that, that there's a strong Northwest wind here in Wisconsin, when that might be like, this is when I normally would be flying out of here. Um, but we take good care of them over the winter and it eventually wanes, but that is Zuckenru. We have a lot of words of the day today. I hope somebody's keeping track. There's a lot of crossword puzzle words today. Okay, our next one is, is it typical that males initiate unison calls and how about dancing? Oh, good, good question. I didn't even get to that. Y yes, you know, with all of the associated um, uh, exemptions to the rule, um, but typically the male will start. And I think we, we heard that really well um, and you can see it with the Siberian cranes with their very dramatic unison call, the male will often start. Um, and with the SARS crane, uh, you could hear the male starts by that brrr, it has a very rolling call before they start their, their call. So there's, there's some cues that a male will put out there to bring the, the female into that. So it is often started by uh, the male. Okay, the next question is a little tricky. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Is there, a learned, is there a learned component to these behaviors or is it instinctive or is there a way of even knowing? Yes, to both. Um, so that the, the phylogenetic tree, um, the work of uh, uh, George and that, and that author, it, it is obvious that there are definitely some instinctual um, ingrained behaviors that, that they will do. Um, but we also know that these, these birds, they're, they're, they're tied and their, their family groups are very, very tight. And there is obviously a lot of things that the parents will teach the chick. And I, I don't know if I could go through a list of these are obviously all, you know, ingrained and, and inherent, and these are probably learned. Um, and some of it, it's not, it's even the inherent behaviors that they would do naturally. It takes practice, um, a unison call and, and dancing to kind of get that synchronicity definitely takes practice. Um, so it's, it's, it's yes to both and also a combination, if that makes sense. I'm not trying to ev evade the question, <laughs> I promise. But of course, it's not as simple as just a a list of one and a list of the others. Right. Um, okay, the next question we have is, and you can kind of expound upon this a little bit, will males of all crane species drop their wing when calling? Or you could just use it to talk a little bit about the different positions that cranes use in, during unison call. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so that is that is one of the many things that George looked at in his dissertation. And so there he looked at voice, and you know, literally analyzing the sound that these birds made, the physiology that made that sound via those all those species, um, but also so this that was mostly on on posture, correct? Yeah. So it, it, that goes back to that tree that there are other things, other behaviors associated in some cases with the unison call that divide these birds up into their their groupings as well. So some of them are so much more elaborate, like the Siberian cranes. And some it's really as, you know, the, maybe the sandhill has one of the most simple uh, of the Groose species um, genus, uh, that they, they each have a, a very distinctive call, the male and the female and a, and a posture, but it's not 
quite so elaborate. And the crown cranes, of course, have um, more of a, we didn't, we didn't play it here, but they have that, that uh, kind of throat patch that they actually have kind of a booming voice and it's not necessarily that duet that some of the other birds have. So it really goes back to that, that family tree and the groupings of the birds kind of define the postures that are incorporated with the voice and the posture. All right, uh, our next question is about uh, sandhill cranes and their coloration. So in the fall, uh, this person sees them brown and in the springtime, they're gray. So are the feathers changing colors, something washing off or what's, what's going on with those sandhill cranes? Right on, our favorite, everyone, sandhill crane. <laughs> that is something that we didn't even, we weren't even able to get into, Hannah and I. Um, so the behaviors can be grouped together. Like, um, so there's all the vocalizations. There's most of the behaviors. The biggest grouping is antagonistic, but then there's a whole group of parental behaviors. And so that, you know, and that's a breeding behaviors might be a better way to put it. So with sandhill cranes, a very, very, it's not unique to sandhills, but not many species do this, is that they paint. And so here in Wisconsin, we have the, our beautiful wetlands are very, have very iron rich soil. And sandhills will purposefully take clumps of this soil and rub it into their feathers. And being iron rich, once it comes out of that wetland and gets into the air, it rusts. And that rusty red stain is exactly what happens. So often the birds in the spring, um, I've seen birds that are, man, they are just brick red. They are, they really, really painted themselves. And then in the fall, you might see, um, you see more gray cranes, but that is their, those red feathers have been molted out. So sometimes they're even speckly. They, they will have the gray and the red feathers together. It's just beautiful. Kim Russell, if you're out there and her art, um, we have uh, uh, some of her products in the gift shop and she um, has based a lot of her Santo crane art on that, that feathering with the gray and the red, it's just gorgeous. So that is what that's all about. So uh, very much in the breeding behaviors that may, might be our uh, behave 2.0, Hannah. <laughs> we just yes. look at breeding behaviors coming soon. <laughs> All right. Um, you said it is important to watch their feet. How powerful are their feet and legs? Probably have a story. Oh, that. Very. Um, so Andy, you and I have, have banded many a Santo crane together and whooping cranes. And those are the things that you really want to watch out for um, are those, are their feet. So those long legs have a lot of torque. And if you can imagine it's, they want to face this direction and they have very, very sharp toenails um, and they can cut. And I have, I have gotten punctures and I know that our colleagues in uh, our aviculture department that take care of our captive family of birds have many a scar uh, from, the, uh, from the talons of cranes. So their beak is sharp. Uh, they have a long neck that can have a lot of inertia, um, but I am definitely much more wary of their feet. I've lost several good pair of pants <laughs> that have been ripped <laughs> uh, by their toenails. Um, so yeah, you do, you do have to watch out for both ends, but uh, not so much the beak as much as the feet. The bigger the bird, the, the longer the legs, the more the more oomph they can they can give. For sure. Um, do different populations of sandhills have accents based on where they are oh. in parts of the North America? Uh, you know, I bet they do. That's something that I've never looked into. I'm not sure if anybody has. Um, you know, if anybody has gone on to the Cornell uh, Bird Lab uh, website, you can hear you know, multitudes of recordings of songbirds. And it always tells you where they're from because a lot of songbirds that have a wide range have dialects, um, accents by any other word, I guess. So I would guess that cranes do as well. Um, certainly the different subspecies, greater, 
Canadian and lesser subspecies have different voices, but that is, it could be attributed, attributed to size. With a larger bird, you're gonna have a bigger trachea, a deeper voice. Um, smaller birds, of course, will have, have a different voice. So that's fascinating. Um, just gonna say probably, but I don't know. All right, so the next question is interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a woman in Florida who has a pair of cranes and one is missing its foot below the ankle. Oh, yeah. Uh, wondering what could cause this and how it might affect mating, breeding, that sort of thing. Right, so uh, two questions, how it happened, how it might affect breeding. Um, boy, there's lots of reasons that it uh, could have happened. In Florida, of course, you have alligators. Um, it could got it, its foot bitten off. Up here, we have snapping turtles, uh, same thing. It doesn't take much uh, for, uh, for a snapping turtle to take off the foot of a crane. Um, if it was broken, if there was an infection, um, it could have gotten necrotic. So the, the flesh dies and it could have fallen off. Um, so many, many things. Oh, also fishing line. Any people that fish in our audience, make sure that you clean up all your fishing line. Fishing line gets caught around that. It can easily amputate uh, toes and legs. We have seen that, very sad. If it is a female that lost uh, a foot, given the postures that cranes take while copulating, it might not be able to maintain that steadiness for the male to be able to copulate. If it is the male of a pair, it probably will still be able to copulate because they balance on more on the, of the leg on the back of the female um, is balanced up towards the hock. So if it's a male, it might not uh, impact breeding at all. If it's a female, she might have problems with balance and it, it may very well impact um, the ability of the male to fertilize an egg. Right. Just scrolling through the rest of the questions here. There's a whole lot of them. Um, during migration, why do sandhill cranes circle above a town or city to, to gain altitude? Or is there another reason that they do this circling? Um, so they will circle like that on migration wherever there is a thermal. And so cities would have uh, with that the, the solar gain in uh, with the asphalt and all those buildings, there may very well be concentrations of those thermals above cities. It also might be that that's where most people are. And so we see it more <laughs> there. There's always that to take into consideration, but um, very likely that it is just the, the warmer air above uh, a, a city center makes those thermals. And so the, the birds will use that to gain altitude. I have, I was hoping that Dr. Westling would, would weigh in on the accents because he is the person that has studied the, uh, the voices of Eurasian cranes in Germany. So he says uh, he has not studied sandhills, but I have studied the language difference between the red crown cranes that are non-migratory in Japan. So on the island of Hokkaido, and mainland China and Russian red crown cranes. So the migratory um, breeding cranes there. And they are so different from each other that apparently they don't understand each other. So that is really fascinating. So a non-migratory species that's not geographically very far from a migratory species of red crown crane, their voice is drastically different. So with sandhills, it, it might be a little bit more subtle since the, the populations are have been mixing um, for a long time, um, but that is something that is really interesting. Thank you, Bernard, for throwing that in there. I appreciate that. Next, uh, we got more. He also wrote when it comes to um, mating for life that he's mm -hmm. he has a divorce rate of about fifty percent in Eurasian cranes. So oh goodness, yeah, what's happening over there in Germany? <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> Um, next question is, you could, uh, does a pair always raise two chicks? Talk no. About productivity in cranes. No. So almost all the crane species lay only two eggs. Um, and it, it, there's so many things that it depends on um, if, if the chicks, if the eggs hatch at all. And then if those chicks grow to be big enough to fly, 
um, either on migration or just um, for non-migratory species um, become part of that non-breeding flock. So most, I would say most of the time they do not raise one, even one chick. It's more, more likely that, that both uh, eggs are lost somewhere along the way before they become flighted chicks. That's a gross generalization. Um, but would you, would you say that Andy? I mean, we've been talking about this with sand hills. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's some pairs might raise a chick every year, but some pairs might never. So on average, certainly um, it is very rare to, uh, to have twins. Yep, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, we got about a minute left, so I'll just ask one more oh, goodness, yeah. question. Um, pulling their legs in could confuse recognition by hunters when they're flying. Uh, is, there, is there education for hunters uh, when it comes to sandhill cranes and, and hunting seasons and that sort of thing? Um, that, is a, that is a very good point. Um, typically, where there is sandhill crane hunting, there's also goose hunting, and those seasons probably overlap. Uh, so that isn't as much of a concern. It, it would be a concern where there are whooping cranes present um, and where there are sandhill crane hunting seasons with whooping cranes present, there is, I believe, mandatory education um, to tell the difference between sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. And as far as we know that that works, but um, that is something that definitely we pay attention to at the Crane Foundation to ensure that that kind of education does happen where there are hunting seasons. Oh, thanks for the questions, everybody. That was phenomenal. Thank you, Andy, for curating. <laughs> I appreciate it. So I wanna go uh, ahead and again, thank uh, Tom and Jan Hoffman for sponsoring. Thank you so much to you two. Please join us next time, next year. Happy New Year, everybody, January 20th. My Journey with Cranes, featuring the beautiful photography and video from Suming with Spike Millington, our Vice President International for Asia. Thank you all, everybody. Um, this whole thing is made possible by you and your generosity. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please be a member. If you're a member, give a gift membership at savingcranes.org. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good day.